Bonjour, David. How are you doing today? Hey, Christophe. Uh, good, thank you. I'm so glad we managed to catch up. Uh, we did very briefly, like a month ago, uh, in Singapore, at Money 2020, I believe. Money, yeah. That was fun and, and interesting and different. Uh, of all places, we can't do it in London usually, so we uh, we do it in style somewhere all over the world. But but you're the real jet setter, not so me, not so much me at the moment. But uh, today, so we are here at the uh, Innovate Finance Global Summit 2019. You just moderated a panel. How did it go? Uh, actually, it went very well. It went in some very unexpected directions because I was moderating the panel about AI ethics and governance, mm -hmm. and the idea of the panel was to discuss if the kind of ethical frameworks for AI could become an element of jurisdictional competition, which I think they could. Um, and if so, who should create those frameworks? So the idea is, if we can make London a place where uh, we have ethical frameworks, where people understand how AI is using their data, uh, the, the audit trials for their decisions and so on, all the things people talk about, would that potentially make uh, the UK a better place to do business, and I think it would, because I think the potential for using AI, you know, particularly in the kind of reg tech space, to cut the cost of doing business, is significant. And in Mark Carney's opening, he's the governor of the Bank of England, in his opening speech this morning, he said one of the key elements of their program going forward is to start looking at machine readable regulation and review of the PRA regs to see if it's possible to feed those in to, I think on his slide, he said cyborg regulators, which is a fun word. But yes, it was great. But it wasn't about the technology. It was about the ethics, governance, compliance around AI. And your goal was to, or your mission, was to steer the conversation, I guess. So uh, the different panelists, were they in favor of it? And did they found identify some clear solution? Uh, well, my, my mission was to make it fun for the audience. I mean, that as well. Yeah. That's why I'm here. Um, uh, I would say the, the, the three takeaways I picked up from the panel, you know, the panelists did have very different perspectives, which was very good. Um, but I would say the three takeaways I took. Um, so first of all, I, 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 the first thing is the idea that the ethical framework is part of the jurisdictional competition is correct. I think most people seem to agree with that. The second point is the ethical framework isn't just about the AI itself. It's about the data sets you feed into the AI. It's about the rules you give the AI. The ethical framework is more than just simple policing of the AI algorithms. In fact, a lot of the algorithms are the same. It's the data sets that are different. Um, and the third point, which actually wasn't part of my thinking going into it, was the panel didn't really seem to like the idea of, of the government constructing this ethical framework. Um, they felt there are other actors uh, who, who could come together to do this kind of thing. So, so two, two outcomes that, um, well, one outcome I definitely expected, one outcome that as the conversation went on seemed reasonable, and one that I wasn't really expecting. So all, all things considered, it was a good panel. Very rich and diverse then conversation. Is there any way we'll be able to uh, listen to that panel? Uh, you know that after the event, or there'll be a write-up somewhere? Or will you write, and you're prolific after all? Uh, I, I will blog something about the panel because I was particularly caught up in the discussion about facial recognition for pigs, which uh, which took the which took the conversation in some unexpected directions. So I'm going to write that <laughs> up. Um, I don't. The honest truth is, uh, Christopher, I don't know. I think they were recording, but I don't know. Okay, you were one of the unarguably like uh, leaders or, or thought leaders for sure in the world of payments. It's been a long while you've done that. And you build that credibility, you, know, you, you did, you have. Um, and you talked about AI, we, talk, we could talk about so many subtopics within payments. Is there one single topic you're most excited about, again, in the payment world today? Well, I, I don't know if excited is the right word, but the, the concerned about or the thing I'm, I'm most obsessed with at the moment, which of course means what are my clients most obsessed with at the moment, is is actually strong customer authentication, mm -hmm. because you you know about the European regulation. So everybody has to spend money on secure customer authentication. That, in my opinion, is an opportunity to build some more infrastructure, which could be used for other things. Um, that in turn could take us a step further towards real digital identity. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that sort of stuff at the moment. If there's a thing that's you know, coming next out the corner of my eye, it's got a lot to do with the, the whole kind of internet of things, bots, because those are becoming payments environments. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, right. of course they have different threat models, security, and all this sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's fun. There's a lot going on at the moment. So mentioning IoT, we need to mention 5G, I guess. So uh, how soon do you think like uh, the market will be ready to really embrace 5G from a consumer standpoint? Because we're still early in the day, especially in the UK. Uh, I think I think consumers will not. You know, 5G is an industry infrastructure. You know, you don't you don't sell consumers 4G. You sell them data plans, and you know it will be the same thing with 5G. I I think 5G in the mass consumer market is still some way away, though. To be honest, I mean, we talk about it a lot because we're interested in it because the Internet of Things perspective. But that's still some way away. And by the way, it's not obvious to me that that's the right way to deal with the Internet of Things security anyway. Because adding SIMs to devices, you know, is, is not the cheapest proposition, is it? So no, not quite, but it, but yeah. It, but it's undeniably interesting and fun. I'm interested in tech. I'm obsessed with it. So yeah. smartphones and uh, with, you know, the recent launches of those market of 5G in uh, um, South Korea and in the US. Quite interesting uh, to me as a, as a tech addict. Or, um, so uh, we believe at the FinTech Power 50, you know, that it's important to help FinTech again um, make a name for themselves, think about digital marketing and branding as well and rely on the power of people like you, the influence in their specific uh, fields. So uh, how, how much in need are uh, you think FinTech about, again, brand awareness and consideration to, uh, to significantly grow in their own markets or globally? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert on branding, so this is, this is outside my envelope. Um, but what I would observe is the costs of doing something great in that space have never been lower. You know, if you think about what it's like to start a fintech now, rent some space on Amazon Web Server, get something up and running, get an app out there, start getting some buzz going on social media and so on. I mean, I'm not really an entrepreneur, I'm an advisor, but it seems to me there's never been a better time to try and build something new in that space. And here, where the regulatory framework is, is positive and encouraging for those kind of businesses it's fantastic did you have a niche or no not at all like to start something uh, not at all just advising is is satisfying enough for that? Uh, you need you need different you need different dna to be an entrepreneur but if i was going to try something entrepreneurial it would definitely be in the digital identity space you know that's a that's an area where despite repeated efforts we still don't have the infrastructure that we need identity theft and fraud are still out of control you know nothing is happening to improve that so if i was going to do something it would be there so the last question i mean you you mentioned uh, how good an environment it is in the uk still is it going to be for the foreseeable future despite you know all the conversations and that word that the b word we won't be uh, talking about as such today you know i i'm not sure it's really going to affect london very much London will still be the centre for finance. It will still be the centre for fintechs. And, uh, so I honestly don't think it's going to affect London that much. Like, you know, there's a lot of people who are worried because of, of getting the right workers and visas and things like that, but I'm sure London's lobbying will pay off. You reckon? I hope, actually. I'm quite invested in that <laughs> as a Frenchman. But thank you so much for your time, David. It's always a pleasure. And, it's always uh, a pleasure to talk to you, Christoph. Thank you. Thank you. you take care. Bye-bye.